Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. <clears throat> Do you remember playing hide and seek as a kid? Most of us remember that game. There's one objective, find the person that is hidden, seek out the other players, tag them before they get to base, and then they become it. Simple enough. Hours of fun when you're about six years old. I remember as we got a little bit older into our teenage years, we made it much more complicated. It was the same basic principle, but we played with teams, 10 or 15 here, and. 10 or 15 over there, and then you can capture the other team's flag or capture the other players and put them in the jail. If you play at night, you can hide people and jump out, jump out at somebody and scare them, and it's, it's tons of fun. Everybody has a big time. Hiding and seeking. Seems that we do a lot of that. Seems that we do a lot of hiding and seeking in our days towards God. We have a natural inclination to seek after God, and we equally have an inclination to hide from God. John chapter 4 tells us that the Lord is a seeker of the hearts and minds of people, and he seeks people to worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus told the story about the shepherd who left the 99 in the fold to go and seek the one who was lost. God seeks us personally, individually. God seeks the race of mankind, that we would know him in his truth. Tied to that in the word is the inclination that we must also seek him. We must seek him out as well. We looked at 2 Chronicles 7 a couple of weeks ago. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. There's something inside of us that causes us to want to seek after God. There is an instinct in the heart of mankind to pursue truth to look for the answers, some explanation as to why the world is the way it is and how do we cope with it. Granted, we are often misguided in that. Very often we seek answers in the wrong places. We worship the wrong things. But the instinct is there. And the human race is created with a need to know, a need to know him. God put that there. God put that in the heart of us. And even in light of that, some feel like God is hiding from them. If God is seeking us, and we are seeking God, why is it so hard for some people to get connected? Why is it so hard for people to see and understand the truth of God. We're seeking God. God is seeking us. Why can't we find one another? I think so often it's because we take God casually. I think very often humanity has a very small view of who God is. And we don't seek him in all of his truth, but we seek the God we want him to be. Think about the misconceptions of who God is that you've heard in your, in your days, that God is some kind of benevolent grandpa in the sky. He's the man upstairs, the one who controls the weather and our health concerns and not much else. Or that he's out to get us, and God seeks to punish us for every misstep, and if we do it wrong, he's going to get you. So often, people think they can take or leave God at will, ignore him and his purposes and his plans and his glory until things are really tough, 
and then I call on him like he's my personal 911 service. Rescue me from this emergency. I think so often we take God casually. We take him lightly. We fail to recognize that he is the king of all glory. He is filled with majesty and awe. We fail to recognize his holiness. We fail to see his perfection and his glorious being. We fail to have that sense of awe. We expect God to fit our preconceived notions about who he should be rather than who he truly is. My friends, God is not hiding. God is mysterious, I grant. God is beyond our true comprehension. But he is not hiding from us. He is a holy being, and he is altogether different and separate from us. And because he is holy, and because he is God, there are some factors we need to understand in our seeking of him. We cannot come casually to God. We dare not take him lightly. We're going to be in Psalm 24 this morning, thinking about the nature and the character of God, understanding a little bit more about his being, and I hope we can see how he truly seeks us and how we might be more effective as we seek him. So Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2 to start. Would you stand, please, that we would honor the reading of God's word. David writes, The earth is the Lord's, and all of its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Almighty God, as we look into your word this morning, we do pray you would speak to our hearts. You would draw us closer, that we would know you, that we would honor you, that we would seek you in all your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Be seated, please. As you look around the world, you cannot help but recognize that God is magnificently creative. Consider the beauty and the diversity of nature. How intricate it all is. Every snowflake a masterpiece. From the mountains to the sea to the deserts to the forest, there is beauty and wonder all around. Consider the intricacy, the delicacy of the hummingbird. Consider the sheer power of the African elephant. God is the creator of all that and everything in between. He rules the world with majesty. We're learning more and more about the sheer size of the universe. Tremendous. And God is God over all of it. Consider the incredible diversity of the human race. The uniqueness and individuality of every person. There are 8 billion or so on the planet and no two are alike. Think about the joy and wonder of the birth of a child, the life cycle that we live through, the adventure of a lifetime of 60, 70, 80, 100 years, and all the things we experience along the way. It's incredible, and our God is the author of all of it. What a mighty God. We serve, and we dare not take those things lightly. We dare not take him casually. God created all of this with a spoken word, and it was not complicated for him to do that. He did not stress out over it. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. Psalm 19 tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Colossians chapter 1 talks about how he created all things in heaven and in the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominion, principalities, or powers. God is the author of all these things. He is magnificently creative. As we go back to Psalm 24 for a minute, 
Very often these verses are used to discuss our stewardship and the reflection that God owns everything and we have a responsibility to him to care for them in a way that honors him. And all that's true. And we really don't own much of anything. God owns it all. And in his grace, he allows us to use some of it. Sometimes we use it to honor him. Sometimes we use it to disgrace him. In the greater context of the psalm, as we consider how we seek his glory, if you think about king and kingdom, you must recognize that part of seeking God is seeking God in and through the things that he owns and cares for. The idea of a king is somewhat different for us because we live in a, allegedly we live in a democracy. In that day, the king actually owned the land. He was the owner of the land. Do you remember, do you remember the Robin Hood stories way back when? Robin Hood, you know, Sherwood Forest, all that. Robin first got into trouble with the king because he shot a deer in the forest. The deer belonged to the king, and that set off the whole chain of events. The, the wildlife, the trees, the land, all belonged to the king. Robin dishonored the king by shooting the deer without permission. We do the same sort of things when we fail to recognize God as the creator, as the author of all this, as the rightful owner of all these things, and we fail to understand it all belongs to him because he created it. We seek God because he is the creator. He is the author of all things. We also seek God because he is absolutely and purely holy. As we go to verses 3 through 6, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? How can we stand in the presence of God? As I read through these verses, I was reminded of Isaiah chapter 6, and Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up on his throne, and his glory filled the temple. And Isaiah said, Woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I am not worthy, and I am not nearly good enough. He was overwhelmed by the holiness and the majesty of God. And if you saw God to his face, you would be too. <clears throat> Moses was speaking with God and, and said, God, show me your glory. And God put Moses in the cleft of the rock and covered him with his hand. He said, you can see my back. You cannot see my face because it's too much for you. His glory is overwhelming. His holiness is incredible. We cannot comprehend it. It's too much. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Now the hill is referring to the place where God dwells. It may be a reference to Jerusalem, the temple, but I think in context of the psalm, it's referring to his holy place in heaven, the throne room of God. And it's a hill that is impossible to climb, to bridge too far. How could we ever come to the presence of a holy God? I don't have clean hands. I don't have a pure heart. And we know that God cannot and will not look upon sin. God is light and purity. And we are just not. As Jesus died on the cross, carrying the sins of the world, and the world became dark. And Jesus said, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we can only begin to experience what Jesus experienced. For the first time in all eternity, 
when there was division in the Godhead and the sins of the world separated him from his Father. How much more disqualified are you and I in our broken and natural selves? How could we, sinners that we are, seek the face of a holy and pure God? We're disqualified from his very presence. Clean hands, pure heart, has not lifted his soul to an idol, has not sworn it deceitfully. It's not me. But praise God for verse 5, which tells us that he gives us the blessings of righteousness. He gives to us, he provides for us the purity that we need. And the only righteousness, the only rightness that we will ever have comes from him. And it's not something we earn. Isaiah, in his cry of brokenness, in his woe is me, I am undone, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst these people of unclean lips. And the angels that surround the Lord took the coal from the burning fire and put it on those lips to purify him, to burn off the sin, to make him pure and worthy once again. And Isaiah, Isaiah said, I, I will go, send me. Our only righteousness comes from him. And that's why it is by grace that you were saved, not of works, not of being good enough, not by law, not by rules, not by anything we've done. It is his mercy that purifies us. He cleanses our hands. He, he cleans our heart. We are recipients of his grace and nothing more. He's the God of our salvation. He is the Holy One who saves the lives of men. And we rejoice in him. And it's all in him. And it's all because of him and his grace to us. And right there at the end of verse 6, Selah. It's a Hebrew word. It says stop there for a little while. Ponder that. Think about that. Let that sink into your mind and heart. The holiness of God. And how he offers that redemption and purification to us. As we go down into verses 7 through 10, how do we get that? How do we, how do we comprehend that? How do we receive all this? Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The strong and mighty, the mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in to you. Who is this king? Who is this glorified one? How do I know him? How can I find him? It seems that this psalm was written uh, in relation to 1 Kings 15. The Ark of the Covenant was being moved from one place to another, Kirath Jerem to Jerusalem. And some of the folks that were entrusted with moving the ark took it lightly, took it casually, and they laid their hands upon the ark itself, and they fell over dead because they had dishonored the ark. They had dishonored the Lord. They had fought, failed to follow the Lord's very specific instructions about how to handle this most holy thing. And they fell over dead. And I can see David as a witness to that, and he wonders out loud, who is this king? Who is this king in all of his holiness? What kind of king is this in all of his glory? He is holy, and he is serious about his holiness. <clears throat> who is this king? Fast forward a thousand years or so, and the question is asked again, who is this Messiah? Who is this Jesus who calls himself a king? What is he truly about? It's hard for us to comprehend. He is too much. There are many words you could describe 
used to describe the character and the person of Jesus. Compassionate, courageous, wise and insightful, full of love for people, all that and more. But one characteristic that perhaps gets overlooked, Jesus was serious about his mission and about his purpose. He's serious about his people. He's so serious about us that he gave his life for us. And instead of you and I dying for our sins, God himself dies for us. He took our redemption seriously. He came as a man. He humbled himself even to the point of death, the death of a cross. He came to earth to be our sacrifice. All of it was serious throughout of his days. As you probably know, people will sometimes share their personal and private things with me just to have someone to talk to, and I'm honored by that. And very often it's about life and death and all sorts of anxieties and worries that come along with that sort of thing. And when it's high stakes and when there's major life change happening, when it's the for real deal in your life, I see the seriousness of it that you're going through. And I see the significance of it and how impactful it is for all of you. So you know that burden. And you know that heaviness that comes along in your life at these certain occasions. Jesus had that with him all the time. He had it with him every day of his life. It was high stakes each and every day for the Lord. We thank God that he took his mission and his purpose so seriously for our sake. And we are blessed and we are redeemed because our Lord pursued his serious calling. Lord, our God is holy beyond our comprehension. God the Son, Jesus, became like one of us so that we would experience the fullness of God, so that we would know him. And the way that we become clean, the way that our hands and our heart become purified is only through the blood of Christ, only through faith in him. With the blood being upon our lives and his redemption and his salvation in us, being in Christ, as Paul taught us, God sees us as holy and as perfect as the Son, Jesus himself, which permits us into his presence, which enables us to seek him and to know him, to come into his place and worship and adore and experience all that he has. Who is this King of glory? Who is this Holy One? He is the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Knowing these facts, it's a fine thing. Information is power. But information alone is insufficient. Knowledge, fill your brain up with all kinds of things. And that's not the same as a personal faith in the salvation of Jesus Christ. And as people of faith living out this salvation, we are called to be continually seeking after God, continually pursuing after the Lord. And it's something that is personal and intimate. And there's something in that expression about seeking his face and pursuing him, the yearning for him, the longing to know and experience all that he has for us. And it speaks to relationship, to unity, harmony with God. What joy, what joy our lives would experience if we had that in our heart and in our mind and in our action and attitude every day. In so many areas of life these days, we are in the midst of reconfiguring, aren't we? Because of pandemic, because of COVID, because of all the weird stuff, we have to find certain ways to navigate our lives. We're rebuilding, we're reformatting, and some of it's small things like, you know, having to have your mask with you. You check, I got my wallet, my keys, and my mask. Got to have that, but some of it are big ways. 
all this? How are we going to celebrate Thanksgiving and Christmas this year when we can't gather with our family the way we're accustomed to? How are we going to get our kids an education? It's complicated. I think there are a lot of people dealing with a sense of isolation and loneliness and disconnection like never before. And as we go through this period of isolation, as we go through this period of feeling distant from one another, people are asking the important questions again. What's this really all about? Why is the world the way it is? What's happening here? People are seeking answers and they're, and they're trying to make connections. They are and they will be seeking God's face to find some assurance that there is a purpose in all this that there are some answers, that there's a reason, and one day we're going to come to the end of all this weirdness. The component of faith, our spiritual selves, is being renewed in the lives and hearts of people. God will always use the difficulties of life to draw us closer to himself. So in this time of drawing closer, in this time of asking important questions and seeking him in a way that is honest and earnest, let us all get serious about his holiness. Let us get serious about his being. Let us never take him casually or lightly. He is Jehovah God. He is El Elyon, God Most High. And we dare not take God for granted, or think of him casually. And we cannot afford to give him anything less than our very best. One more verse I want to share with you from Isaiah chapter 55. If you're seeking, if you're struggling, if you are pursuing after him and not finding answers, Isaiah tells us to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. To our God, for he will abundantly pardon. He's not hidden. He's not hiding from you. He is not withholding himself from you. And he can be found when we humble ourselves, when we confess our need for him, when we let go of ego and pride and self-righteousness. Seek the Lord while he is near. I urge you, my friends, call upon him to trust in him. Come to Jesus. Humble yourself before him. Find his grace and receive all that he has in store for you. He loves you. He is seeking after you. Will you seek after him? Amen? Father God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for love and mercy and hope. We thank you, Father, that you do pursue after the hearts and minds of mankind. I pray, Lord, we would be receptive to you. I pray we would open our hearts to you. I pray, Lord, that we would be as serious about pursuing you and seeking you and knowing you as you are about us. We give you all praise and we give you all glory. In the great name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. As we close this morning, we have a hymn of invitation for you. And I invite you to know Jesus. I invite you to commit yourself to him yet again. I invite you to surrender all you have before that throne of grace. The altar will be open. The altar such as it is will be open for whatever prayers are on your mind this morning. And I thank you for being a part of it all. Let's stand together. Elizabeth will lead us. My prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office, 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.